Well, welcome everyone. So glad to see the smiling faces this morning. Uh, Happy New Year. Glad you're uh, here in the new year sharing your time with us. And I know the Lord will bless you for being here today. I wanted to mention that today is the first of seven messages for the new year. And we're going to begin this entire study of the history of the Christian church. And that will be the subject for six more Sunday messages after this one. And so I'm hoping that uh, you can be here. We are, you may have noticed, going to uh, video these so that we can put them on YouTube for those of our membership that won't be able to be here for all seven Sundays and won't miss that. And uh, so that's uh, our hope and prayer. So let's get started this morning. Those of you all who are visitors or uh, haven't been here for a while uh, may uh, not recognize that uh, most preachers have a podium and they preach from notes and their Bible on the podium. I uh, don't like the podium and all of my notes are right here. And so you get to see all the notes. Um, Let's start, I thought, in the new year, going with our namesake, the chief cornerstone. And you've been able to see these verses of Scripture here, but we're going to go through them in detail anyway. But let's talk a little bit for just a moment about what a cornerstone is. Everybody knows this, but let's just review it. It's where people who build buildings put the meaning of their sponsorship. Some of them are uh, religious. Some of them are municipalities and different kinds of businesses. And so we have some of those here. Uh, But the one I like best is right here that we've blown up Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone. And you know, when I read that, it got me to thinking, and maybe you have too, and maybe you've already gotten the answer, but don't give it because I like to give it. Uh, Let's look at the Apostle Paul, and you can turn to this in your Bibles or you can just read it with me here. Paul says, For through him we both meaning Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, that's a mouthful, but Paul always does that. So we just get used to it. He says that, Jews and Gentiles have access by the one spirit to being the household of God with the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but it has this household of faith has a chief cornerstone. But not only Paul, but also Peter comes to us in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6, and he says, coming to him as a living stone, Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So, Here it is, the two top apostles are talking and saying, hey, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Well, here's my question. If this is a building and this is a top view of the building, which corner is the chief? Have you ever wondered that? Have you said, oh, what does that mean, chief cornerstone? How can you have a chief cornerstone? There's four of them, right? Those of you who are mathematicians out there. Well, I propose to you that the only way you can have a chief cornerstone is with a pyramid, a capstone, a chief cornerstone. 
So we see that in the pyramids. We see that in our own seal with the dollar bill. You all did realize that this is the front of the great seal of the United States of America, right? Because it says it right here, the great seal. And on the back side, the one that's got the eagle on it, it says, of the United States. So this is the front of our great seal. Everybody, everybody knew that? It's in your wallets if you got a dollar bill. Uh, and what it says here is that God in Latin is favoring our undertaking. Favoring our undertaking. Novus ordo seclarum. And that means a new order of the ages. No king, no queen, no hierarchy over these people. And so they came up with a pyramid, the strongest geometric shape anyone can ever know. And we have that. We just saw that a couple of days ago, right? Look at these triangles. Triangle, 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 triangle. Because it's a strong shape. It holds together better than anything else. So let's look at how maybe we can sort of put this together, this chief cornerstone thing. And is that biblical or is that Michael McCormick just kind of making, trying to make something up to make a good sermon? Uh, I don't do that. So in the parable of the vineyard, Jesus says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And when he uses that term cornerstone, it's the Greek word kephalan. Kephalan. And kephalan means the head of the corner. The head of the corner. Not just a cornerstone. And so, you know, you wouldn't have a stone that looked like that at the corner, right? It wouldn't fit. It wouldn't work. It's more like a capstone. So in an equilateral pyramid, the top weight pushes down equally onto all stones toward the bottom and holds all the stones together. So we're going to see how this symbol for Christ, right? This is the Cairo, right? The Christ, Cairo, and he's the Alpha and the Omega. That's why we've got him put in as the capstone. And so we have this idea from Paul in Ephesians 2.18 that we read. He says that we're all in this body of Christ that is a household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, Paul doesn't put things and the Greek language doesn't put things in um, sentences for random choice. He specifically put apostles and prophets first. Why does he do that? Because the New Testament takes precedence. It's the story of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So the New Testament takes precedent over the Old Testament, the prophets. Because the prophets shadowed him coming, right? This is not new to any of us. We're Christians. We're mature. We understand that. So it's New Testament first and then Old Testament. And what you do is, let me use my hands here for a second. It's not Old Testament and that's the foundation. Then you lay the New Testament on top of that. It's the other way. Jesus and his precepts and his life and his work are the foundation of us as Christians. And then you use the Old Testament to feather in, to feather in, to say, hey, God has always had a plan. God has always uh, been looking to get his family back, to get us back into the fold, to have adopted children. And we feather that in and we use that as examples and it boosts and bolsters our faith. But we do that, we don't do that, right? Okay, so am I preaching here or are we okay? Can I hear an amen out there anywhere? Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so the Bible is that foundation. When 
Paul says the apostles and prophets, that's the Bible, right? The apostles of the New Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament. They are our foundation for everything, and Jesus Christ is the top. So he said the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and guess what? What shape does a diamond have? I've got it upside down from the setting. What is that? It's a triangle with many facets. Triangle with many facets. That's the strongest thing. You'd see it mostly like that before it goes into the setting. So what Jesus meant in the parable of the vineyard is the stone, the sun and the air that the builders rejected, the Jewish leaders rejected him, has become the capstone, it says in certain translations. And we know that Jesus himself used kephalon, the head of the corner, of the fruitfulness of the vineyard. That's us. We're the fruitfulness of the vineyard. So let's get some numbers. Now, this is not, if you don't believe this or you don't like this story, it's not a question of salvation. But I just thought it was very interesting. And I think that the Holy Spirit put this into our Bibles on purpose. There are many significant numbers in the Bible. Those are just a few of them. But 17 is particularly Interesting and particularly applicable in the Bible. So here we've got an equilateral triangle, and 17 is the number of man's work within God's plan. So you have the number of man, 10. I have 10 toes. I have 10 fingers. So that's kind of the biblical number of man. And then 7 is the number of completion. So that's 17 together means man's work within God's plan. And you see it many places. So what you do is you take 17 and 17, and guess what happens? <clears throat> um, look at Genesis 8. The ark rested on the seventh day, on the 17th day of the seventh month. Then in Jeremiah 32, God purchased the land for 17 shekels of silver. And then in the Gospels, Jesus was resurrected on the 17th day of the seventh month, seventh month. See there what we've got a pattern going. These are not the only ones, just the highlights. But the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month. That signaled the salvation of Noah and his family. Jesus resurrected on the 17th day of the seventh month. The complete salvation of all of us into God's family that will believe upon him. So, we're going to John 21, 1 through 11, and I won't read that whole passage of Scripture, but I've got it kind of summarized for us here. Peter said, now this is, as you know, after Jesus has been crucified, and Peter doesn't know what to do, and the rest of the disciples don't know what to do, so Peter says, I'm going to go fish. So they did. They caught nothing. Jesus was on the shore. He said, throw your net on the right side. The net was full of fish. John said it was the Lord. They all came to shore. Jesus had fish boiling in bread. And the net had 153 fish, but the net was intact. Have you ever wondered why that number's in there? Why is it 153 fish? Why does that matter? What in the world could be the importance of 153 fish? Well, it's in the Bible, right? So it must be important somehow. So, let's look at it. In an equilateral triangle, if you put 17 dots at the bottom equally, and then you put, you have 17 that you go in ascending order, but down in number. In other words, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, all the way up to 1. Guess what number you come up with? 153. And what is that number, 153, in the Bible, in the Old Testament particularly? That number is the number for fruit bearing. So we're starting to put this puzzle together, fruit bearing. In Exodus 12, 21, ha Pisak in Hebrew means Passover, and Passover, guess what, the the numeric equivalent of those letters 
in that word, Passover, is 153. Isaiah 43, 3. The Hebrew numbers, 153 again. What does that say? What does Isaiah 43, 3 say? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It comes out to the number 153. <clears throat> In the Gospels, Jesus blessed 153 individuals, if you want to take time to count them. <clears throat> why, does, why did it stop with 153? Why wasn't it 152? And then in Acts 27, 36, this, that's the story of Paul's shipwreck. And if you remember the story of the shipwreck, when Paul was being taken to Rome in chains, and um, they had a terrible storm, and Paul says they start to kill some of the prisoners and some of them start to jump overboard to get away from the ship that's falling apart. And Paul says, don't anybody go. As long as everybody stays on this ship, we'll all be saved. And guess what? They were. And so it's 276. Why is that in there? Why would it say, and there were 276 people and they all were saved. I'll answer that for you. 23 is the biblical number for death. And so Paul said, let's all stay in, and if you count up in an equilateral triangle all the way to the top, you get the number 276, and they were all saved. There was not a man lost. So we have this over and over. I'm just giving you some proof texts so that you won't say, you know, I think he's crazy. And I may be, but not for this reason. 153, uh, 276, perfect equilateral triangles. And so what we're trying to say is the church is fruit-bearing as it stays in the work for us within God's plan. So now we're going to get to where it really applies to us as church. And it's Cornerstone Church and any church of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the apostolic church, which is categorized by historians as between the years A.D. 30 and A.D. 400. And then we have the Anabaptists who come along in about A.D. 400. And they are the closest people to understanding and following this methodology that is in the New Testament, the Bible, and what the Bible says. What the Bible says about the life and work of Jesus, the Bible precepts, and it's congregational. There's no hierarchy. There are no bishops. There are no high priests. It's the priesthood of every believer, right? We've heard that many times before. The priesthood of every believer. So Cornerstone Baptist Church, under Jesus Christ, believes in these things. It came from the Piedmont. Back in the days from 400 all the way through the 1600s, 1700s, what we have is Anabaptist congregations. Has anybody done a search of Anabaptism, and Dr. David Drake, you cannot speak because he uh, has done it, I know. And, um, and um, the Anabaptists have a history of being Bible people, and there, are two, there, there came to be two sects of these Anabaptist folks back in Europe in the Alps and in all that area of Central Europe and Northern Europe. The passive side of the Anabaptist congregations were the Mennonites, the Quakers, and the Amish. You've heard of all of those, I'm sure. And some of those came just like they were to the United States of America. William Penn in Pennsylvania was mostly Quaker, right? You've heard that in your history books. And then on the active side, were the Baptists, the Waldensians, and the Hussites. And um, these, I've got a little asterisk here, because they were all congregational, no hierarchy, but 
The actives sought to blend into society and be salt and light, whereas the passives said, no, no, they're too much for us. We're going to kind of be just all us, all ourselves, and that's the way we'll stay closest to God. Well, we don't believe in this side, or we would be, you would be worshiping today in a Mennonite, Quaker, or Amish church. And it's not that God doesn't love them. God does love them. But we just believe differently, right? <clears throat> so, what is an Anabaptist? And this is going to have a point. Right? We're going to get down to cornerstone. An Anabaptist is one who truly believes that God speaks in his word in such a way that one has immediate access to God and stands individually responsible before him, responsible only to God for the decisions of the soul unhindered by man. You know, when the Anabaptists came up against uh, the Pope in Rome, they were slaughtered. <clears throat> because they didn't believe the Pope was supposed to be able to tell them what to do and how to do it, how to worship, how to be close to God. <clears throat> the Anabaptist, Anna means re or again. So an Anabaptist is just a, a re-baptizer, an adult baptizer, because you know the, the Pope and the Romans said that they would baptize babies and so almost everyone in the days from 400 to 15, 1600, 1700 were baptized as infants. And then when they came to adulthood and they wanted to believe in Jesus Christ and they wanted to believe in the Bible and baptism by immersion was the norm, they had to be re-baptized even if they had been baptized, which... 99% of them had been as babies, right? Got your history, history hats on? So Anabaptists were the foremost proponents of religious liberty in the 16th century. They believed that each man or woman should be free to read the Bible for themselves, to interpret it in their autonomous congregations, and obey it without interference. Isn't that kind of what we believe in? Isn't that kind of what you believe in? Well, you would have been killed back in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century for believing that. The Great Commission is the operative clause for Anabaptists. It appears more than any other text in literature. The quest is to make disciples, baptizing him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism being the public declaration of an inward change. First teach, then baptize, teaching all mankind to observe all that Jesus commanded and exhorting one another to obey. Isn't that what we believe in as Baptists? If you think about it, this is what we believe in. And there are the scriptures there. I'll give you an example. This is Balthazar Hubmer. And he was an Anabaptist leader in Moravia where he was the head of a large congregation of Anabaptists, our forerunners. He said, the truth occasionally lets itself be captured, yea, lashed, crowned, crucified, and buried, but on the third day it will rise victorious and reign in triumph. What he was saying is, you know, all you other people who call yourselves by certain religions, you know, you crucify the truth, but on the third day it's going to rise. And... You know, we kind of relate to that story, don't we? Well, what happened to him? Hummer was taken to Vienna. He was tried by the heresy court on the rack. He was stretched on the rack and tortured, <clears throat> pulling all of his bones out of joint. This did not cause him to recant. He was sentenced to die at the stake, at the stake on 10th March, 1528. When he arrived at the scaffold, accompanied by a great crowd of people and followed by an armed company, he raised his voice and cried out in the Swiss dialect, O oh, my gracious God, grant me grace in my great suffering. And turning to the people, he asked pardon if he had offended anyone and pardoned his enemies. When the wood was already in flames, he cried out, O oh, my heavenly Father, O oh, my gracious God. And when his hair and beard burned, he said, O oh, Jesus. And when they put 
gunpowder into his beard so that it would catch fire better, he said, salt me well, salt me well. And what about his wife, who was a believer also? In these same things that we just talked about that we believe in. His wife, a few days later, was thrown from the large brick bridge over the Danube with a stone tied around her neck and drowned. You understand how great it is to have the freedom that we have to believe what we believe? And how many people in the past, hundreds of thousands, have been done this to because they believe what you believe, as you believe. And you believe in the priesthood of the believer. So, we have an Anabaptist heritage. So many people say, ah, those Baptists, you know, they're, you know, not good people. They're fundamentalist. Yeah, we are, and we're proud of it. We're fundamentalists of the Bible as our rule and guide for life. And that's where we come down to the life and work of Jesus. Those Bible precepts, first of all in the New Testament and then in the Old Testament. And we're congregational. We believe in the priesthood of all the believers who have the Spirit of Christ in us. So we come down to Cornerstone Baptist Church. Now you're saying to yourself, oh my goodness gracious, uh, is this what he's going to end on? Well, sort of. But I'm going to end on three or four slides here that will explain this. This is from our good friend J.M. Carroll about 90 years ago that was a great theologian and Christian historian. And he put together this whole chart. And the reason I'm showing you the whole chart is to give you an idea of all that he went to. And he put a little uh, explanation here. It's going through from zero to the year 2000, and it's got all these red dots on it. He calls it the trail of blood, starting with Jesus and the apostles, and then how these dots sort of came together through different um, centuries. But there's this one line that's constant through it all. So let's look at it really quick. I'm going to go through this very quickly. And um, you don't have to get everything because we're going to revisit this in, in the next six weeks uh, to talk a little bit more about it. But Jesus organized his church in the first century and then the apostles and the first generation had that organization. But almost immediately they were under persecution and a threat of death and also death. Now, the church and state was united about 400 A.D. When it was united, the Anabaptists said, nope, we're not going to go with that church. And so there, was, there were things where there was government, church government that was changed. Uh, infant baptism came in in the late 200s, early 300. Um, there was a great persecution. And then you notice that the Anabaptists were in the hills and in the mountains and in the, some of them in the cities. And now I'm not trying to make certain people mad, but I probably am going to make some people mad. I don't want to. I don't seek it. But I'm just trying to explain from reading of history. There were the Montanists that came along here, and they were the first charismatics. And if you consider yourself a charismatic, that's okay. Give me just a moment. <clears throat> uh, and also, the Donatists and these other folks, the Paterines, were the first ascetics that came along. Now, what does all that mean? Real quickly, the charismatics said, who were the Montanists mostly in that day and age, they said, we're going to reform the church through new prophecy. You don't have everything you need in the Bible. God has come to me specifically, to us, and has said, there's a new word. And 
So they sought to reform the church through new prophecy, not biblical prophecy. And I know a lot of charismatics today go with Bible as the foundation of what they believe in prophecy, and that can be okay. It's just that we Baptists don't prefer that. Why don't we prefer that? Because we have everything we need to know. If you, if you and your prophecy matches up with the Bible, then that's fine. Then just say, hey, I've got a Bible verse here that I want to give you, and I'm going to say it out loud and prophesy over all of us as the Spirit of God because of this Bible verse or because of this precept in Scripture. You don't need to make yourself a separate sect, a hierarchy within the same congregational church. And then the ascetics said, oh, we're going to remove the church from the worldly altogether because the world is just done with, and we're done with the world. So we're going to separate from that. So even way back in the 30, 30, 300s and 400s, you had this tension between the charismata, the middle road, and the ascetics that said, we've done with this world. Now, if you look at the top of this, we're almost done. We might still beat somebody to lunch. Um, you had this Catholic church where Leo II officially established that he was the head of the church. And then all of that, we had infant baptism established by law, indulgences, purgatory. The belief in purgatory didn't come along till 700 years after Christ. Saint and image worship, which we don't do, of course, and then they split. The Greek Catholics went one way and the Roman Catholics went another way, mostly political. But what happened down here? The Anabaptists just kept on through the centuries in the hills. In They called them rustics, the rustica, the lower people in the world. They said, hey, we're just going to believe in biblical truth for the world. Biblical truth for the world, not biblical truth that takes us out of the world. And so you come down, you have the Greek Catholic Church going this way and all of these things happening we're going to talk about later. The Roman Catholics came down this way and uh, all of these things happened. And mostly the Roman Catholics were the ones that were the reason for all the martyrdom that we talked about and will later on. But John Wycliffe came in at that point in time, and what did he do? He translated the Bible into English for all of us English rustics to be able to read the Word of God. And the Lollards, because the Bible was forbidden, in 1229 the Pope came out with an edict that said, you cannot read the Bible. You are not worthy of reading the Bible. Only us priests will read the Bible and tell you what it says. And it's our story, and we're telling it like we like it. 1229. So the Lollers and Wycliffe said, no, no, we want to read it in our own tongue. And so the Lollers were, they gave us a bad, a, a bad um, name to loll in Middle English was just to walk around without a good job, doing nothing, panhandling, and uh, you know, they called them lollards because they were preachers who went from town to town. And guess what was the main thing that was the thing that designated a lollard preacher from anybody else? And this was a code they always carried a stick that had a spiral upward. You notice the spiral upward? And it had a spiral upward, but it still touched the earth. So that represented this preacher that was constantly trying to help people spiral upward while still on the earth. And they walked with these kinds of sticks. And every Lollard carried this and bits and pieces of scripture that Wycliffe 
had translated so they could go into the towns and go into the little greetings and gatherings and the marketplace and share these little pieces of scripture in English. So, to finish up here, the Protestants went one way. The Lutherans, the Calvinists, the um, Congregationalists, the Church of England, the Methodists, and all of these were Protestants. But the Baptists were never Protestants. They were never part of the Catholic Church in any way. And so they didn't have to protest against the Catholic Church. They were just Bible people in the hinterlands. And so they just kept right along believing in those things we read about before and the priesthood of the believer. That's what the pilgrims were. The pilgrims weren't Puritans. Sometimes we, we confuse that and we think pilgrims were Puritans. Well, Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England that still had a lot of the trappings of Rome. But the pilgrims were Anabaptists who said, no, we believe in the Bible and priesthood of the believer. So there's that whole thing that we're going to study a little bit more in detail and get some more stories out of as time goes by. But that is what we want to remember as we finish up today. We are a whole body under Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega. We are Jesus Spirit-led, Bible-based, and congregational. That's where we have always been. That's where we're going. And everybody that wants to go is welcome. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you 